Good morning. Good morning. Nothing like flying by the seat of your pants and having no idea what's planned. <laughs> um, we are going to open up this morning with a song called Your Grace is Enough. Please stand and worship with us. this morning, and I'm not sure where the baptizer is, and that is why there's so much confusion. And rather than letting y'all think this is how it goes all the time, hey, there he is. Normally, it's a little better planned than this. Sometimes we just have to adapt, and so we be okay. I want to tell you, first of all, this morning, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, more than anything else, I love you. But even better news than that is that Jesus Christ loves you and has an incredible plan for your life. And today, we are celebrating the baptisms of, of many of our, our young people coming. And we're going to have some family members that are actually baptizing many of them. Um, I want to encourage you, as we get started, that whether you're live streaming this or whether you're here in person, we are so thankful to have you. And one of the ways that you can follow along is... 
You can download our Central Baptist Church app. Now, you might have saw some of the pages coming in where you can scan the QR code, but you can also get it by going simply to our website, centralbaptistyork.com, and on the home page, you can download our app, and there's a lot of great things you can do with it. First of all, if for some reason you're traveling, you can live stream in the service. You can even share the live stream. Um, you can see the upcoming events that are taking place in the church. That's very helpful. And if when you subscribe to it, if you'll allow the notifications, that's how we remind everybody of what's happening in the church. So it's a great tool. One of the greatest things about it is it allows you to give online. And many of our folks really love that. It's a way that you can sacrificially give um, through um, electronic debit or through checking accounts. It's a great way to do it. But if you prefer the traditional way to give sacrificially, there's offering boxes at the, each of our doors as you leave out. Um, we ask that you pray over that and drop it in as you leave because we know that's an important part of worship at the same time. Um, we don't pass the plate, so don't be shocked. Um, today, we are celebrating this. Peyton is coming first, and if you see looks on our faces, I just want to give you a heads up. The baptistry heater is not working, and y'all can be seated as well. <laughs> Come on down, Peyton. <laughs> it is chilly, yes. Um, Peyton gave his life to Christ at BBS, and him and his father, we sat down and we talked about what it meant to be a believer, and he's been asking questions, and he is following today in believer's baptism. Peyton, what is your profession? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Based on your profession, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> down, Zoe. Zoe's coming next. She also followed in Believer's Baptism, I mean, following Christ at VBS, and she's following in Believer's Baptism this morning. It's cold, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. If you saw me this morning running through the church with five-gallon um, pots of boiling water to dump in here, just know that that effort was wasted and it did not make a big difference. <laughs> but God will reward our efforts. Anyway, Zoe, what's your profession? Jesus is Lord. Based on your profession, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is where it gets really fun. Tiffany, come on down. Oh, <laughs> Tiffany's allergic to cold water, just in case you know. <laughs> no cussing in the baptistry. It doesn't matter how cold it is. <laughs> privilege of baptizing her niece Aislinn. Um, not too long ago, we began to pray for people in our circle of influence, people that we were trying to, to see come to know Christ, and we wanted them to know Christ and know his peace and know his love. And Aislinn was one of those people we've been praying for um, this entire year. And Tiffany's put you on that. And every time we met for small group, Tiffany would not let us leave until we prayed for Aislinn. And today, those prayers and all that effort is coming to fruition. Aislinn, come on down. Embrace the coolness of the baptistry <laughs> world. One thing about this, they will never forget this baptism. <laughs> Aislinn, what is your profession? Jesus is Lord. Based on your profession, we baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. that what she's saying is burr it's cold <laughs> now i have a few people getting baptized next week we'll have something fixed by next week don't back out <laughs> chancy you ready <laughs> no <laughs> chancy came to us last week after the worship service and said she wanted to give her life to Christ, and, and we led her in that. And this morning, Miss Jane, her grandmother, has the honor of baptizing her. Amen. Again, Miss Jane has been praying for her family for some time, and today, Miss Jane, those prayers come to fruition as we see the work of Christ in the lives of our family members. Chancey, what is your profession? Jesus is 
Based on your profession, we baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bring her down so I can go. And you may be wondering, what's the deal with having so many people baptized in the church? Because this is the first time you've seen this. In our philosophy here at Central, we believe that all of us, every every minister is a priest before the Lord. All of us, there's a priesthood of all believers. And if you make a disciple, we're going to let you baptize them. Because that's what the Bible calls for. And that you make disciples who make disciples. Now, if you're here, I just want to share this with you. If you're here, I want you to know that at Central, we don't want you to stay where you are spiritually. And we have a plan for that growth. We have a process for that. It starts with coming to know the Lord Jesus and loving him and obeying him and worshiping corporately with the church and worshiping personally at home. If you're doing that, say, Pastor, well, I want to go a little deeper than that. Well, the next step of that is getting connected to one of our small group Bible studies. We call those connect groups. We have some of those in the traditional Sunday school hour, some of those in the evening, some of them at home, some of them on campus. We have them all around. Actually, we're launching another one for ladies out of Ginger Queen's home. It's going to be taking place um, in the next week, I think it's when it's a couple uh, weeks from now. Uh, we're going to push that back to the 25th when it starts. Um, for ladies, it's a ladies only. There will be food, which, uh, man, I'm sorry. You'll have to fend for yourself that night. Um, ladies, we'd love for you to be a part of that. But if you're interested, we would love for you to sign up. So as you learn to love God and love people habitually, the next step is learning to love people and biblical community through one of our connect groups. And after that, the next step will be one of our discipleship relationships. And maybe you're doing those first two things. You think, well, Pastor Will, I've never done the discipleship relationship. What does that look like? Well, very simply, it is a, another disciple. They take you for a limited time period, and they work through a process of discipleship that helps you grow through discipleship, learn how to share the gospel, learn how to live in faith to a point where we release you, and you take someone else, and you disciple someone else. You might have noticed the web of, of yarn as you came in. That's our discipleship board. And then after you go through that, the process that you make disciples, and the end result is that all of us as believers in Christ – Make disciples who make disciples. We want you to grow in faith. We want you to be all that Christ has called you to be, and we want to help you with that. If you're here for the first time, I want to tell you again, thank you for being here. We love you. As you came in, you should have gotten a gift. Um, in that gift, there is a connection card. That connection card allows us, if you can do two things, you can fill it out and you can drop it in the offering box as you leave, or you can scan the QR code and do it digitally. But what it allows me to do is it allows me to pray for you this week. And if you have any special prayer requests, you can fill those out and put that on there. It also gives us a chance to follow up and just get some feedback about how you were treated. All those things are taking place. And again, I want to tell you that I love you. Thank you so much for being here. And let's pray and let's continue in worship. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for those who have given their life to you, Lord. Thank you for those who have followed in believers' baptism. You are so good and so holy, and there is no one like you. Lord, I praise you for your mercies and for your kindness. And today, Lord, I pray that you would bless Central Baptist Church, Lord. Bless it, Lord, so that we love you more than we do. We love you, Lord, but not nearly enough. Help us to love you more. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to love one another in that sacrificial way that your son demonstrated for us. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help, our, help us love our neighbors, those neighbors who are different from us, who think differently, who believe differently, have different values. Help us to love our neighbors and our community the way we love ourselves because that's what you've commanded Lord, I pray that you'd help Central grow in discipleship, Father God, through worship, Lord, through relationships, through biblical community. And Lord, I pray that you would grow your kingdom here through more men, women, and children coming to know you as Lord and Savior and following in believers' baptism. Thank you for all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Let's continue in worship this morning. We have a new song um, that we want to teach you guys. Um, new for us, hopefully you guys have heard it um, on the radio or, or in Christian worship, um, but it's called Promises. And the chorus of it says, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. I think that's so important for us as Christians that Sometimes we have to let our heart learn the lesson. Um, we have to let our heart understand that when God says it, he means it. The timing may be different than what we thought. Um, 
we're seeing so many prayers answered in this baptistry this morning, but I imagine that when they first started praying that prayer, the people who were praying assumed that God would answer it quickly. And that is just not always the case. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes years. And so I just want to encourage you this morning as we sing this song um, to really speak that word to your heart that when God speaks a word, it will come to pass. Um, and just remembering great is his faithfulness to us. You're the God of covenant, faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Lamentations 3, verse 19 says, The thought 
of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet, I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. And I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, and therefore I will hope in him. Every breath that I am able, 
I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Well, looks like I turned that on at the wrong time, and I might have been singing on the live stream. So y'all got the bonus plan if you're live streaming for that. Sorry about that. Um, good luck tuning that into the mix. Anyway, um, before we get started, first, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, I want to give a quick shout out to my Alex, our youth director, and then to, um, to Tiffany Leary, and to Todd Leary, and to Julie Martin, and Jonathan Martin for coming Friday night and, and suffering for Jesus with a youth um, in a lock-in. And I was reminded of something that has been, I've known for some time, and that is I'm too old for that. <laughs> and I didn't think I was, I never think I'm as old as I am until I try to stay up all night long. And for some reason, it hurts me now. Amen. So it, it was quite the moment. But um, I did beat Tiffany at mini golf again. That's all that really matters in this. Um, but don't bowl for money against Todd. Um, <laughs> Because he's kind of a ringer. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, anyway, uh, thank you so much for that. But um, we appreciate that. And many of you are like, I can't think of anything worse than staying up all night. And you might be right. But it was pretty tough. But honestly, there's a lot of things to be afraid of. As we talk about fear today, I'm reminded. Um, Tom, I mean, Tom Skeen is actually doing security today. But Tom will be quick to remind you that my greatest fear, my greatest irrational fear is my phobia of spiders. And this latest invasion of Joro spiders coming in is exactly what I dreaded um, to happen. It took over my hometown of Georgia. They're moving here, dreadful little monsters. And I saw, we were actually finishing the fence outside around the HVAC system on Friday. And I walked outside and I saw something I hadn't seen some time. It was, it was one of those wolf spiders that looks flat. I don't know if that's the right name of it or not, but it's like this huge spider about the size of half dollar. Are y'all waving at me or are y'all waving at somebody else? Okay, making sure. Um, and I was reminded of a situation that some of you might know about, but it happened probably about 20 years ago. We were moving from Georgia. We were getting ready to sell our house and put it on the market, and the laundry room that we had built onto the house was not yet finished. And as I was out there working on it, it we were tying it into the existing uh, rafters coming off the roof, and I looked up, and there was the biggest spider I have ever seen outside of some horror movie. And it looked at me, Miss Sylvia, and it muttered some really ugly things. I'm not exactly sure what it said, but I threw it some gang signs, and it barked at me, and I could hear it hiss and growl. It was a terrifying moment. And um, I was paralyzed in fear, terrified, couldn't move. So I did what any good husband does. I called for my wife to come help me. <laughs> now, Erin, since we've been married, understands that her role in this marriage is, um, is definitely to kill the spiders in the home. That's just the rule. That's just, that's just how God designed it. So she, she comes out. She's like, what is it? It's another spider. And she looks up. And this time, even Erin is shocked. She goes, oh, my goodness. That thing's huge. It, it was terrifying. It was huge. It was a monster. And it was on the wall. It was still looking at me uttering some very ugly remarks. And as I started to move, it moved with me. And I thought, it's got its radar on. It's locked in. I'm done for. So I did what anybody does. I picked up the shoe. It was similar. I started throwing stuff at it. Bounced off, didn't bother it. Aaron stuck back at the kitchen. I couldn't move because it was watching me, you understand. It was a serious situation. Brought some Raid out, sprayed it with Raid. 
it just laughed at me. <laughs> it was terrifying. And the last thing I remember before it all went black was as I sprayed another can of Raid at it, it jumped off at me. It's a true story. And as it did, I grabbed my wife and threw her in front of me as a human shield. <laughs> and you would think, that's been 20 years now, you would think we, she would have gotten past that, but every time there's a problem in our home, she reminds me that I didn't love her enough to save her, but rather used to sacrifice her as a human shield in the face of this giant, terrible spider that aimed to kill me. And that's a true True story, except for maybe the room. I don't think I, if it uttered something, I couldn't understand what it is. But it was growling and barking at me, so it was that big. This morning, we begin to look at fears. And while that's an irrational fear, there are some fears that can move into your life that can control you. And some of you here, you may be dealing with fears and anxiety of your own. And when I say that, some of you may be facing serious situations, whether it's a job situation where you don't know what your job is going to be tomorrow. You don't know how to provide for your family. Um, times are tough financially. That's no secret out there. You're looking at what's happening in the world, and fear grips you because there's wars and rumors of wars. They're struggling um, out there. Prices are on the rise. Inflation's through the roof. And at the same time, you don't know what it's going to look like, and you're worried about your kids. Because at the same time, with all the problems of being an adult and being a parent and this world, not only are you dealing with trying to pay bills, you're trying to make sure your marriage is healthy, you make sure you got health care, you're making sure you got retirement, you're saving all these things, all these things are taking place in your life. At the same time, um, you're consumed with worry about your own children because you're worried about them making terrible decisions in their life, you're worried about them going down their own path or doing something disastrous in their life and you're praying for them, you're worried about them, it's consuming you. There are so many things to worry about in this world and sometimes you begin to wonder, where is God in the midst of all these fears? Well, I just want to take, tell you something. Take courage because the Bible speaks directly to fear. Not just once, but several times all through Scripture. We are in our series, Welcome to Faith in Uncertain Times, as we study um, the books of First and Second Thessalonians. We work through books of the Bibles at Central. We're working exegetically expository through these books. We went through First Thessalonians before Vacation Bible School. And what we learned was that the book of Thessalonians, the first one, was written early on in church history. In fact, First and Second Thessalonians, aside from the book of James, are the oldest books in the New Testament, even older than the Gospels. That's how old they were written. And what we find is that somewhere around Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas and his team, they went to Thessalonica to plant the church, and at first... The ch very, it was very receptive. People were hearing the gospel. They were being saved. Lives were being changed. They were coming to know Jesus. Great things were happening. And as often happens, a persecution arose against the church there in Thessalonica. And the persecution was so intense, it was physical, it was violent, that Paul and Silas were driven away from the church. They were torn prematurely away from the church before it was established the way they like to establish churches. So Paul has had to leave early from Thessalonica. Now this is happening in Acts chapter 17. So somewhere between Acts chapter 18 and 19, Paul is writing these letters to the church. That's what's taking place. So that's how old these books are of the Bible. So as he's writing this, the first time he writes them, he's worried about them. He's concerned. And the Bible says that he's tried to go visit the church in Thessalonica several times, but Paul says that Satan has prevented him from going. And he gets finally says, okay, I'm just going to send Timothy. So he sends young Timothy to check on the church. And when Timothy gets to the church in Thessalonica, he doesn't find a broken down, beat up church that has caved under the pressures of persecution. Rather, he finds a thriving biblical community there. This church is on fire. They're doing great things for God. Their love is, for each other is incredible. Their love for God is legendary. They're doing awesome works of God there despite terrible persecution. They are suffering greatly, but they're still living faithful for God. Paul's encouraged. So he ends up writing this details about, they had some questions about the return of Christ and the end time theology. They had some questions about what they were going through. Paul encourages them in their persecution, encourages them in their theology, pats them on the back, tells them how great they're doing. And then Paul, after he sends the letter, he gets another report back for the church. This time, what he finds is that things in the church have not improved. In fact, the situations they were facing have actually gotten worse. As bad as the persecution was when Paul was there, it has gotten worse now to the point where people are being martyred there in the church for their faith. 
And on top of that, there are some people running around giving some really bad advice about the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the middle of their persecution, some chucklehead is running around in the church of Thessalonica, and they're telling people, Jesus has already come back. He's already taken the church. The end time is here. The day of the Lord is upon us. That's why you're suffering. God has forgotten about you. That's what they're thinking. Now, that sounds crazy to us, but it threw them into a world of panic. And Paul writes the second letter to the church there to encourage us threefold. It's to encourage them in their suffering. It's to give them a little better information and to calm their fears about the return of Christ. And also to give some practical ways about how they should live that out and about the perseverance of true believers. So that's what he's doing here. Last week we talked about his word to those who are suffering. And what we learned in that was that Paul tells them, I know you're suffering. I know things are tough. I know that times are really hard for you. But he tells them, God is using your suffering to make you fit for the kingdom of God. That's what he tells them. And it's an encouragement to them. And now he's going to change gears and he's going to give them a little bit of comfort about the end times and about the return of Jesus. So with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, let's read together. If you're there, say, I'm with you, Will. Let's go. All right, y'all are with me. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him. That's what we call the rapture, by the way. When he says, the word rapture is not in the Bible. But when, he, when you hear him talk about us being gathered to the Lord, that's what Paul's talking about, the church being taken up. It says, being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts everything against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do not remember... Do you not remember that I was still with you? I told you these things. And what is restraining him now will continue to do so until his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders. With all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Father God, I love you. Today I pray that you would preach to me. I know that I am not, um, I know that I am not worthy to preach your truth. I know that I am not adequate in my own. To be able to do this, so Lord, I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, that you would carry the truth of your gospel to our hearts and teach us to apply it, Father God, in our lives. Lord, I love you and I praise you and I thank you. Please work right now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As Paul moves from the issue, issue of their suffering, he, he moves to resolve the confusion that's going on about the return of Jesus Christ and the church being taken to him. I told you that... Somebody is spreading the rumor in Paul's name that Jesus has already come, that the day of the Lord is at hand, and that they have been left out of God's gathering to them. So they're worried and they're frightened. And he takes time to encourage, their, to encourage them. And what he says is, don't be so easily shaken. Don't be so rattled about this. Don't jump to conclusions just because some prophet of doom is saying in my name that Jesus has already come back and done all these things. And then he reminds them of all the things he taught them while he was there. And he puts to order some of the things that have to happen for the return of Christ to come. So he's saying, guys, what you're, saying, what you're afraid of is not rational here. He's saying, what you guys are afraid of, it couldn't possibly have happened because other things that I told you about haven't happened first. And he lays out some things. He said, first of all, before Jesus comes back and gathers the church to himself, some things are going to happen. The very first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a great falling away. The Bible calls this the great apostasy. Apostasy is a big churchy word. It means people leave the faith. It means they turn away. And Jesus talked about... Are y'all with me? Okay, y'all still with me? Okay. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24 in great detail. 
And what he said was when it gets near the end, there will be a great falling away. He said many will be led away by false teachings and false doctrines. Many will turn away because, they're, uh, because of anger, and many will turn away from God because their love will grow cold. All the, because of persecution, because all things happen, there will be a great falling away of the church. This is the great apostasy, the great rebellion that the Bible talks about. Now, can I just give you some advice on this? Because some of you are thinking to yourself right now, I think that's happening right now. That must be happening right now. I, I see it. I feel it. it. It wasn't like it was when I was a kid. That must be what's taking place. Can I just tell you, first of all, I need you to remember that God looks at things from a worldwide perspective, not what's happening in North America. Understand that. Anybody that comes and looks at their little fish tank experience of what's happening and bases all biblical prophecy on that is very short-sighted. Keep your eye on Israel in the Middle East. Because there's going to be a great revival of believers who are Jews, who come to know faith in Christ. That's what he talks about. And that really hasn't happened yet, not least the way we think. So the great apostasy isn't always what's going to take place in the Bible Belt in in the Southern America. That's not what we're necessarily talking about. It's more of a worldwide picture of what's happening. And while the church here may be struggling, there are embers of revival taking place as revitalization and replanning and and new church planning is taking place as well. And what's happening in Africa and Asia and the Middle East is very inspiring because there's great revivals taking place there as men and women and children are coming to know Jesus Christ in those areas which are heavily persecuted. So he said there's going to be a great falling away so, and then what's going to happen? There's going to be a rise of the, what the Bible calls the proverbial Antichrist. Now, it doesn't matter if you've been in church for five minutes or you've never been in church in your life or you grew up in church. You have heard of the Antichrist, whether because secular movies are obsessed with this idea and they, they have so many false ideas about the Antichrist. And when you hear people talk about it, you think of that one big baddie who's coming and he's going to do all this bad stuff. And we've watched all the Left Behind movies and read all those books and all that nonsense. And what we think is that there's one Antichrist, but that's not really what the Bible teaches. According to the John in his epistle, there are many Antichrists. And there have been on down through the ages. Because he says that anyone who opposes Christ or opposes the gospel is an antichrist. Now, leaders have arisen from secular governments since the beginning of time who have opposed God in his redemptive history. They've been working against God. Go back to Nimrod in Genesis. Pharaoh in the Exodus. You've got um, all the Assyrian kings that came in. Then you go into Rome and Greece and all the things that happened there. You know, I mean, listen, you could look at Emperor Nero. You could Emperor, Emperor Domitian. You could look at Marcus Aurelius. You could even look at Stalin and Emperor Hirohito today. I mean, in recent times, you're seeing Antichrist at all point. But what Paul is saying here, remember, you have to look at Scripture in the context of what's being taught. And they're already suffering intense persecution. There are already many there who are anti-Christ. But he says, when he gets close to the end, you're going to notice this guy is going to be different. He's going to be demonically empowered because it says he's coming from Satan. And he's going to rise to power, put an end to worship, all kinds of worship, and declare himself God. Now, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. And it doesn't matter what end time, whether we're reading... um, Harbinger by Con or whether he you know, left behind by Jenkins or any of those guys, we don't know what that's necessarily going to look like because prophecy, especially um, coming prophecy in the future, is always hindsight 2020. I mean, they knew where Jesus was to be born. They knew all the prophecies about him, and they still missed him. We don't know exactly, but what we do know, there'll be an unmistakable falling away of the church, probably worldwide, And there will be a rise of an anti-Christian leader who exalts himself as God in a holy place. That's what Daniel teaches. That's what Matthew teaches. But here's the encouragement that Paul gives them. Are you all ready for this? He tells them that, he tells the church that that has not happened yet. That God has not abandoned them or forgotten them. And that God is actually holding that process back until the right time. He said, there, he said the restrainer is restraining him. Now, there's been a lot of talk about who the restrainer is. 
But can I just tell you that God is behind the power of the restrainer holding this back from happening. So these end time things that are so afraid of, even though this villain is coming one day, God is still in control. Are you all with me on that? God is still in control in this. He is restraining him until the God-ordained right time. And when he does show up, Jesus will say the word, and this bad guy, with all his intention of destroying Christianity and destroying the work of God and the people of God, God, Jesus will say the word and he'll be destroyed. That's the power of God we're looking at. And ultimately, don't miss this. I'm getting to a point here. Y'all ready? Ultimately, what Paul is saying is that believers don't have to live in fear. I don't know what you're afraid of, but you don't have to live in fear. Because ultimately, God wins because God is sovereign and He's in control. He is even in control over the bad guys who reject God. That is the sovereignty of God. And I'm going to throw a biblical truth out. Are you all ready? This is the one biblical truth I want you to get. If you don't, if you don't catch anything else, I want you to catch this. Are you all ready? We can face the future without fear. We can face the future without fear. The return, I'm going to tell you something that is often overlooked because I know as a Southern Baptist preacher, I'm probably saying this, and all my friends would probably shun me for saying this. The church should never live in fear of the return of Jesus. We shouldn't. The return of Jesus should not inspire fear among believers. It should not. I get it. I don't know how many, and I've probably done it in the past unintentionally. We get up, we preach gloom and doom and disaster to come upon you, and then we scare you and we tell you, if you don't do this, you're going to burn in hell for eternity. And while I do believe in eternal conscious torment in hell, and I do believe in the end times, the truth is that we should never live in fear as believers of Jesus returning. We should look toward it with hope and confidence of the great things that God is going to do, even if it seems terrifying in all the details of it. Because I understand, you read the book of Revelation is confusing, it's scary, and it gives you a little bit of anxiety, but you should still read it with the hope that knowing that Jesus is in control and that we should not fear the return of Jesus or the future because our Lord and Savior is in control of this. And this is so important for us to get. We need to make sure we grasp this because fear is one of Satan's greatest weapons against us. It will paralyze you in fear. See, I'm not talking about the fear of the Lord. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That there is one fear that all believers should maintain and keep in their hearts, and that is the fear of the Lord. That God is in control, that God is holy, that God judges sin. And at the same time, we understand as a child fears their father and their parents in, a, in an authoritative, loving way, we should have a healthy fear of the Lord. It's not what I'm talking about. But all other fears outside the fear of the Lord, we must repent of. Let me give you three reasons why. Are you ready? It'll cripple your walk with God. Fear will cripple your walk with God. It will keep you from demonstrating faith. It will keep you from doing what God has called you to do. It will paralyze you in a way where you do not obey God, but you obey your fears. That is the opposite. But you and I, we don't have anything to be afraid of. We don't have anything to worry about because we know that when we're obedient to God, He will equip us and He will carry us out into the day of completion on that. God will do the work in us. And if He's calling us to do something, we don't have to be afraid to step out in faith do it because He will provide a way. He will equip you with whatever you need to be successful. But can I just tell you, I know that fear and unhealthy fear it'll hurt your walk with God but can I tell you, it'll also hurt your relationship with other people? Think about it. When do you feel the least loving in your life? When fear and anxiety grip you. Do you know why most husbands and wives struggle so hard? Financial fear. Financial uncertainty comes in, some tough time in their life, and they're afraid. And when people are afraid, they lash out at people they care about and talk harshly to them. What, think about how many times has fear and anxiety gripped you and you end up snapping at your kids, snapping at your friends, because you, you're not very aware of how you're behaving. You don't have any perception of how you're talking to people. I'm telling you that fear and anxiety will ruin your relationships, not just with God. It'll ruin your relationship with your family, with your spouse. With your family members, fear has a way of hurting your, your relationships here on earth. But it will also, fear will also destroy the joy and peace that you had that comes from Jesus Christ. Knowing Jesus, 
knowing Jesus and salvation because I am justified. This means I have been made right. He has washed me clean of my sins. My sins are forgiven, and I'm in a right relationship with him. He's, I am no longer his enemy. And as a sign, he put his Holy Spirit in me and changed me forever. That's how you know you've been saved, by the way. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you've never been saved. If you've never been born again, if you don't have never had a new nature, listen, I don't care if you go to church every Sunday, I don't care if you've been baptized a thousand times, if you've never repented of your sin, placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit came into you and gave you a new nature, friend, I'm telling you, you're hanging on to a religion rather than a relationship with Jesus Christ because a relationship with Jesus is what saves you. And that relationship inside of you brings you peace, joy. That is the abundant life he's talking about. But fear will rob you of that joy and peace because it makes you blind to the blessings God has already put in your life. You'll become blind to what God's already done and what God's doing in your life. You'll become blind to how He's moving and how He's blessing. You'll become blind to the awareness and the presence of God in your own walk. And if you're going to live with fear, if you're going to live with fear and repent of it, or if you're going to live without fear, some things need to change in your life. And the first thing that needs to change, are you ready for this? You need to start seeing things differently through the eyes of faith. You need to change your perception. See, when you examine the stories of the Bible that deal directly with fear, y'all still with me? I know I'm losing some of you. I know it's early. Some of you are in lock in. I probably kept you up all night. It's fine. You're not sleeping good. I get it. Maybe fear kept you up. Well, I thought you need to hear this. Perception will change what you fear. When you examine the stories of the Bible that deal directly with fear, you know what happens? Very often it's because they were seeing wrongly. They saw the perception of things around them in a way that wasn't biblically true or even had God in them. Go back and look at Moses when when he called him to go to Egypt and speak to Pharaoh and release the people of Israel. What did Moses say? Who, me? That was his response. I can't do that, Lord. I stutter. I can't talk. I'm stumbling over my words. Who am I? I'm a murderer. They kicked me out of that place. They were looking for me. They'll kill me. And he says, you know what? I'm with you. You know what had to happen in that situation? God had to do a couple of small miracles there in Moses for Moses to even have the courage. But when Moses saw it, what did he do? It's like, oh, I'll go. I'll go. Think about Peter walking on the water. He sees Jesus. He's got eyes on Jesus. He's looking at him. He's like, command me to come to you and I'll do it. And Jesus is like, come on, big boy. And he steps out of the boat and starts walking to him. And he's walking on the water. But what happened along the way? He begins to notice the wind and the waves and the storm around him. His perception was taken off Jesus. And he starts seeing the circumstances around him outside of the lens of faith. What did he do? He begins to fear and sink. He says, save me, Lord. Jesus comes, lifts him back up on the water. But they walk back together on the water to the boat. Think about what happened with Elisha's servant. Guys, didn't you have his name in the Bible? But his name is just Elisha's servant in the Bible. And he looks out. The king of Assyria has sent an army, has surrounded Elisha's house. And the servant looks out the window and he sees all the soldiers of the enemy army. He's like, he says, my Lord, what should we do? We're done for. And Elisha's over there eating his Cheerios like it ain't no big deal, big guy. It's fine. He's just going to town. And he's panicking. He's in a full-blown fear and panic attack. And what does Elisha do? He prays. He says, Lord, let him see what's really happening through the eyes of faith. He says, let him see what I see. Basically what he says. And the servant's eyes are open and he sees the armies of God surrounding the Assyrian army. And the Assyrian army is greatly outnumbered and he's not afraid anymore. Seeing rightly leads to believing rightly. And seeing wrongly leads to fearing wrongly. That's what we learn in this. And I get it. As we go through this, that means for us, when we're afraid, we need to pray for God to open the eyes of our faith. We need to pray for Him to let us see things the way we need to see it. We need to help Him. We need His help to see our situation as God sees it in the sovereignty and perspective of a holy God. We need to pray for Him to remove the blindness of our limitations and our inabilities and see things from an eternal kingdom of God and that kind of perspective. So let's stop being blind to what God is doing. And I know that's easy to preach and tough to live. I get that. You lost your job, you don't know how you're going to feed your family, you don't know how you're going to keep a roof over your house, your loved one is sick, you don't know how they're going to recover. All those things, there's, again, there's wars and rumors, wars. I get that. It can be very scary. But let me ask you a question. So far, has God proven that He can be trusted? Okay. At least a third of you say yes. Has God given you so far a reason to trust His character and His power? Yes. Has he done greater things and delivered people from a greater disaster? Yes. 
Is this situation something that can replace you or a situation that can separate you from God's love? No. No. Let's start seeing our situations through the lens of God's grace and love and power and sovereignty. Second thing, second way to apply this and things need to change in your life is don't allow irrational thoughts to diminish God's promises. Don't allow irrational thoughts to diminish God's promises. When fear seizes you, the ability to think rationally goes right out the window. It just it evaporates in our presence. I mean, life becomes overwhelming and the promises of God get easily forgotten. And we forget what we know to be true about God and those irrational thoughts enslave us to fear that control us. Y'all with me still? That is exactly what was happening in the church of Thessalonica. They thought Jesus had come back, gathered the church, and now the wrath of God is being poured out on the world, and they had been left behind. Now, I don't mean to be flippant about this, but that sounds dumb to me. That sounds completely crazy. Like, you think God forgot that you were over there in that city? I mean, is there, was he blind to that city? Is there something that's like a little circle? Listen, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense. But we're going to give them a break because they were shaking in their fear. They were being persecuted. All these things were happening. And, but to be fair, it was a young church. Paul and Silas were torn prematurely from it before it was fully established. I get that. Most of the people in the church were Gentiles, so they didn't have even the Jewish background of the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament to read. So we're going to give them a little bit of grace on what seems ridiculous to me that they thought God forgot them when he came back. We'll give him a pass. But don't miss if you dumb down Paul's words just a little bit. He's basically saying, everybody just needs to chill out, take a breather, calm down, and be rational. You didn't miss the rapture because the great rebellion hasn't happened and the falling away hasn't happened yet and the day of the Lord isn't here because the Antichrist hasn't been yet revealed. That's what he's saying. You know what that means to you? That means for me and you, it means we fight fear with truth. You fight fear with biblical truth. Because the way you feel in terrifying situations is rarely reality. The way you feel is often lying to you about the situation you're in. And if you take a second and you step back and you separate irrational fear, you can have rational thought and you can provide comfort and encouragement with God's words in your life. But we have to learn to do that if we're going to face the future without fear. That doesn't come naturally. We have to be able to get in our situation when irrational fear comes in our hearts and begins to attack us. We have to ask, is what I'm feeling and what I'm worried about really about to happen? Is it even rational? Is it logical? We have to ask ourselves, is this just my imagination running wild? Those are questions we have to. Because you know what Paul told the Philippian church? Paul told the church in Philippi, he said, he said, focus on what is good. He said, dwell on what is true, what is honorable, what is just, what is pure, what is lovely, what is commendable, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy. Think on these things rather than the irrational thoughts that fear produces in your life. This is why it's so important that you understand the promises of Scripture that are to you. Now listen, I'm not talking about taking a verse out of context. I'm not talking about writing um, Philippians 4.13 under your eye or something like that when you get ready for a football game or a track me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding what promises apply to you because I know that you can do all things through a uh, passage of Scripture taken out of context. But when you understand the truth of Scripture, then what you realize then is that God's promises can protect us against irrational fear. When you know what God promises, you understand that He is with you and He won't abandon you. We can find comfort in knowing that God is for us and not against us. We can find comfort and trust that regardless of what's happening, God will see a way through it. And when you understand the promises God speaks about in His eternal, overarching, redemptive history, you can understand something. Y'all still with me? What you can understand is that no matter what comes, God has a plan and it's going to be okay. That's what it means to know and trust God's presence and His promises. It's going to be all right. So when your child is diagnosed with some sickness or you've just learned of a loved one's passing or in a car accident or your husband or wife comes home and they've lost their job and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills, look at your situation through the lens of faith don't let irrational fear control you or seize you. Don't let the enemy use fear to ruin you. 
Fight him off with the promises of God, his word, and God's unchanging character and sovereignty and power. And when you do this, you will experience a boldness of faith that is willing to risk it all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fear will not be the thing that keeps you from obeying God or serving God. Because we're not afraid of what people will think. Can you just imagine how great worship would be at Central Baptist Church if no one came in and was worried what anybody else would think of them as they worshipped? Can you imagine how freeing that would be? Can you imagine what would happen in your life, all those people in your sphere of influence that you're praying, that you want to share the gospel with, if fear of being rejected didn't control you? Can you imagine how such a bold witness you would be? Can you imagine in your own personal life if the fear of missing out didn't cause you to chase after worldly things? Can you imagine in your own walk, if the believers of Central Baptist Church, if we truly trusted that God and believed God that He was the only thing that satisfies and we weren't afraid of missing out, what we could do if we pursued Him alone? Talking about a bold witness that would change the world. Imagine what it would look like if we were never afraid to give God what He's given us, give it back, because we know that He provides, whether it be monetarily or whether it be um, the physical blessings that He's given us, or whether it's our family that we give back to Him. What would it look like if we were that faithful? Because fear did not have a place in our hearts. That's the promises of God that you can stand on. And I don't know where you're at today, and I don't know what you're struggling with, and I don't know what you're afraid of. But I want to just challenge you as we get close to the end that you repent, that you seek God, and you lay down those fears and trust God's character and His protection and His love and His sovereignty over your situations. Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you. We pray today, Father God, that your spirit will be felt that we would know you better. Lord, I pray that as we sing this last hymn, as we sing this last song, that you would move in an incredible way. And that those who have been enslaved to fear, those who have been enslaved to anxiety, I pray that you would release them from those chains and help them to run the race of faith without being hindered by those things. I love you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. As the praise team comes up, I just want to tell you a couple of things that could happen in this. Maybe you're here um, today and you think, Pastor Will, we want to join the church this time. We We've been thinking about it. We've been to the new members class. We, we've gone through all the stuff. It's time you can step out of your seat and come sit right here, and I'll pr- introduce you to the church. Um, if you haven't gone to the membership class, um, we have one scheduled for September 11th. You can come be a part of that. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, Will, I need to give my life to Christ today because I've, I know about God. I've heard about Jesus. I know all the answers in my head, but they've never penetrated my heart. I've never repented of my sin and placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I want to be saved today. Come take me by the hand during this song. I'll put you with a counselor. We'll share with you what the Bible says about salvation. Maybe you're here and fear has just controlled you for a really long time. This altar, like it is always open for you, but it is especially open for you right now. You can come do business with God. Whatever it is that God's put on your heart, now's the time to act. Let's stand and sing.
seated. Um, this morning we have Ed and Carol Gross coming to join. Y'all can stand right here beside me for a second. I won't make you stand up here this whole time, I promise. Uh, they are coming to join the church. They have been baptized by immersion. They've been born again, um, filled with the Spirit. And they are coming to join as members. They have gone through the membership class. Do I have a motion we receive them in membership? All in favor say amen. amen. Any opposed? I didn't think there would be. That is so awesome. As we close out, I'm going to give you a chance. You guys can have a seat right here. Um, as we close out, I'll give you a chance to come by and just love on them and encourage them. Um, I want to remind you of a couple of things. I told you about our discipleship relationships, and I'm doing something tonight that I've never done before. If you're in one of those relationships, we have a dinner planned for you tonight. It's a recap of what those um, discipleship process is, just kind of a reminder. As we've gotten out to third and fourth generations of disciple makers that are going out making more disciples, um, I want to make sure that we stay true to the process and, and true to the teaching in that. So tonight's a great reminder. Um, you guys should have got an invitation for that. Um, and at the same time, I want to encourage you to bring your questions. And if you haven't been in a discipleship relationship and you want to enter into one, I've got some folks coming free that are ready to walk with some people um, as they walk through the discipleship process. If you're ready to make disciples who make disciples and grow in your faith, this is a great opportunity for you. Come talk to me, um, and I'll help you get assigned and plugged into somebody, and you can begin that one-on-one -on -one discipleship process with somebody else. And as we go, I know I've got some visitors here, so y'all allow me one second. We've got to talk. Y'all ready? Okay, this is, we've got a real talk. I love you. We have to change as a, as a body of believers. Here's where we need to change. We do a great job with the greeters downstairs. Shannon did a great job with that. Um, very friendly when we come in the door, but we're not as friendly as we need to be once we get in the sanctuary. Here's why that's taking place. Everybody in the room feels like they're the new guy. When a church grows this fast, as it has, it takes years for somebody to feel like they've been a part of the church for a long time and you're looking at everybody else in the church thinking they've probably been here longer than you that's just not the case so if you've came more than twice guess what you're a seasoned veteran in this <laughs> so what I need you to do is I need you to be I need you to be here early and, welcome, and just love on people as they come in I need you to scan the room and find people that maybe you haven't met before I need you to introduce yourself to them. Welcome them. Tell them how glad you are to see them. Again, I get it. Everybody feels like the new guy in the room, and that's just, that's just the nature of a replant. That's just the nature of, of healthy growth. But I need everybody, we need, including myself, we need to get better at welcoming people who are first-time guests because they are our treasured guests. Okay? So I know you're thinking, I just got here. I'm sorry. Welcome to the front. Welcome to the front lines. That's all I can tell you. Everybody's got to get better at it. I love you. We're doing a lot of great things. God is doing even greater things. He is amazing. We're seeing life saved. We're seeing baptisms. People are joining. We're seeing a baptism where people saved are joining the church almost every week. That is amazing. Let's make sure we do our part as we move forward, okay? Father God, I pray that you would bless this congregation. Help us to love you more than we do. Father God, I mean that. I say that all the time, Lord, but I'm serious. We don't love you like we ought to. And I know that it starts with loving you the most. And then, Father God, help us to love our neighbors and our community. Help us to love the people on this street. And the, all the people in the homes around this church within a half mile to a mile. Help us to love them like we love ourselves because we owe the debt of the gospel to them. And Father God, I pray that you would help us to love one another in a sacrificial way. Lord, help us to overcome our fears and love people and serve you the way we should. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Y'all don't forget to come by and live, love on.